I do just want to say a couple things by way of introduction. And first is this, I, I understand that there are a million things that we could celebrate about Harvest Baptist Church today. So the, the danger of a day like today, when you look ahead to the future and some things that we maybe want to adjust or improve or tweak or those sorts of things, is that you're concerned with that and you neglect to give credence to all of the things that are already a part of the fabric and fiber of our church that are beautiful and wonderful and awesome that, that we all love and enjoy. So today, I don't need to get up and say, you know, my vision for Harvest Baptist Church is that we would be missionally minded because our church already is missionally minded. We, we love missionaries. We invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into missions every year that we give away. That's already part of the DNA of who we are, so I don't really need to cast vision around that. I don't need to tell you today that we're going to take God's Word seriously. We're going to do our dead level best to teach and preach it straight up, as it says, with, without apology, and just say, this is what the Word of God says. We're going to let it govern us. I don't really need to cast vision on that because I feel we already do a good job of that. We do, I believe, a good job of letting the Bible be our sole authority and govern us and be authoritative for us. So I'm assuming that we already understand that. I'm assuming that we already understand that we want a church that is loving, that we love God first and foremost, but then we love each other and we also love those that are lost or unbelievers or our neighbors and that we do our best to do that. So uh, I, I get completely that there are so many things today that we could just have a, a celebration Sunday and we could celebrate all of the beautiful things that are biblical, that are godly, that are grace-filled here at our church. So I, I recognize that. I secondly would say this, just, just by way of introduction, when you're talking about vision, really what you're talking about is a preferred future, and a preferred future always includes a measure of change. So now, now I get as, as a pastor and just a, a human that only wet babies like change and even they cry about it. So I, I understand that. I get that most people have like just a default aversion to change and, and don't want to change things. But I also understand that it's impossible for us as a church family or for you as an individual or you as just your, your own little family unit. It's impossible for things to get better or to improve without changing something. Those two things do go hand in hand. Who would be willing this morning to admit that we maybe possibly as a church have some growing to do that we have not yet arrived that maybe the Lord has more in store for us? Who would maybe be willing to admit, okay, I think that all of us could say, well, yeah, no, no, no. we, you know, we have, we have some growing to do. We have some things that, that we need to work on as a church body. So what that means, really, when you boil it down, is that there'd have to be some things that we adjust or change or emphasize differently or, or do something differently. And it's impossible to keep everything the same and improve at the same time. Those two, they, they, just, don't, they don't, just don't mesh. So here's what I want you to know from, from my heart to yours as a young pastor here at the church and, and looking at vision and a preferred future that inevitably includes a measure of change. I, I just want to communicate today to you as a church family a couple things about change in general. So number one is this, change for the sake of change is, is really dumb and foolish. And I think that we could all, you know, probably nod our heads and attest to that, that no one, including myself, and I actually like change a little bit, but no one, including myself, wants to change anything just for the fun of changing something. It, that's, that's a fool's errand, just to change things for the fun of it. So we need to have solid biblical reasons why maybe we would do something or not do something. We need to be able to ask the deep questions of why. Why would we alter this or change this or, or move this around? And we need to have real answers. I need to have real answers for anything that we do at our church that, hey, here's why we're doing that. Here's the intention behind this. Here's the purpose of, of what we do and why we do it. And, and I would say this, I, I don't think that we should be afraid to, to try new things at times. Now, I don't, I don't want to make the same mistake over and over and over again, but we at least need to be willing to try something and say, you know what, that worked, let's keep doing it. Or, you know what, that didn't work. Uh, many of you come to our Sunday evening service, and, and I told the church a year ago, I really feel like we need to emphasize prayer more and need to make this a bigger part of who we are as a church family. So we sought out to, to pray together corporately on Sunday nights, and honestly, 
we wandered through that a bit for a couple months on, on Sunday nights, trying to figure out how do we do this, what's best. There are some things that we did that I look back and say, you know what, I wouldn't do that all the same way if I had to do differently again. And we found kind of a, a new normal on how we pray together and how we go about that on Sunday evenings. But, but that's the point I'm, I'm trying to say is that we want to be able to try some things and say, you know what, they worked, they didn't work, let's, let's sort it out, let's not make the same mistake twice, but let's not, let's not be afraid to, to try and to push forward and to have a vision for something. And, and I want you to know from the biggest thing from my heart to yours is that I always want anything that we do as a church family, and I know that I speak on behalf of, of the other pastors and deacons at our church, that we want what we do as a church body to be directly in line and in sync with our mission as a church. And our mission is very simple. It's not complicated. We want to make mature followers of Jesus. That's, that's why we exist as a church family. We want, to, we want to see people come to know the Lord, to be baptized, to, to grow in, in their knowledge, to join the church, and then to become a mature follower of Jesus. That's our goal. That's what we want to center on. And anything that we do, we want to ensure that it's in line with that. So, for example... We, back in November, we walked through a series for about a month or so on biblical finance and giving, which it had, it had been a minute since we had really talked from the pulpit about biblical finance and, and just looking at what the Bible had to say. The intention of that was not so that our church would get more money. And some of you won't believe that, I know, but literally that was not the intention. The intention was so that would be in line with the purpose and the vision of our church that we want to make mature followers of Jesus. And part of our maturation process that happens in Christ is we begin to trust him with all areas of our life, including our finance. So anything that we change or tweak or emphasize, we always, and I always, want to be sure that we are are just in step with how can we make more mature followers of Jesus? How can we be better at our mission? How can we do this? So in light of that, I want to give you today, in light of of that mission and that goal, I want to give you five things. So I've I've boiled it down to five simple things that I want to communicate here this morning. One is just a primary focus for this year, then I want to give you two upcoming changes, and then I want to give you two big dreams. So there's, there's one focus, two upcoming changes that I just want you to be aware of, and then I want to give you two big dreams. So I'm going to start just with our focus and our goal and really what I want our passion to be for 2018 as a church body that we would really center around. And that is, I would call it, if I could phrase it in, in, a, in a terse way, I would phrase it this way, it would be community to crowd. And this is simply getting the lost to the message and the message to the lost. And, and my desire, if there was anything that I wanted you to catch this morning at all, My desire as a pastor is to lead and to see our church family grow in this area of doing our best to impact our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to do our dead level best to get the lost to the message, come here, hear the gospel, learn of Jesus, find find out what it means to be part of a church family. But on top of that, to get the message to the lost, to take that to people in your neighborhood or in your workforce or in your family or wherever they may be. And I, I want with all of my heart for this to be just our heartbeat, our passion, our drive, our desire for the next 12 months. And I believe that this is extremely important for us for two reasons. One, one is that it's really good timing for our church, but beyond just the timing aspect, this is something that's deeply biblical and any church should be concerned with. This shouldn't just be Harvest Baptist Church. Any church that's concerned with reaching their community should have this desire for how can we evangelize and reach people with the gospel. But I really feel like the timing is impeccable for us. And I want to backtrack just a minute and share why I think this timing is impeccable for us. About 12 months ago, we, had a, we actually did it on a Sunday night. We had a night just like, to, let's just like this where we said, okay, let's look at the next 12 months, let's game plan, let's talk about some things that would maybe tweak or adjust. And we actually laid out something that is, I feel, relatively simple for for our church, but for any church, as you look at what does a church want to do? Where where does a church head? And we shared a graphic with you that basically showed four steps. If a church is growing or doing something, it's, it's not ultra complicated. You have people in your community that you want to end up coming to your church some way, shape, or form. 
And when people come, you want to love them and steward them and you want to share the gospel with them and see them know to come Christ and, and then you want them to be a part of your church family. And once they're a part of your church family, you want to disciple and mature and you want to grow together so that we can all become mature followers of Jesus. And we even kind of fleshed this out 12 months ago and said, here's really some things that we want to focus on. Here are some steps maybe that we would take to make this happen. And we said 12 months ago that our primary focus for 2017 would be this, that we really wanted to focus on crowd to congregation. I felt as a pastor that we just needed to do a better job of stewarding the people that came our way, of investing in the guests that came our way. And we, I told you 12 months ago, there's a litany of things that we're going to change. We, we changed our order of service and started using maybe a connection card or put the offering at the end and, and started a discipleship ministry and, and a guest center and, and a parking team and some things. Just the way we followed up with guests, we, we really changed. We had been sending just kind of like a generic email, thanks for coming, hope to see you again, but try to be intentional with that and steward guests and do our best to say, you know what, if God's entrusting our church with people that are coming, that are wanting to, to check out church, check out Jesus, find out more about the Christian faith, then we want to do our best to steward them. We want to do our best to be a, a, a family that's expecting guests. To, to understand that the sermon starts in the parking lot, to do our best to welcome people and, and to show them love and grace as, as they come here. So we really honed in on that. And our hypothesis 12 months ago was that if we can focus on this and, and just improve and tweak and adjust some things, then we would see really some drastic improvements across the board. I could give you a litany of different things that we've seen, but in the past 12 months, here are a few things that have happened that have kind of been the result of that focus uh, we baptized uh, 46 people last year. Amen. Now, I think that we could improve that number and see more people come to know Christ and be baptized. But you know what? 46 was a great number for us to have a steady stream of people that coming to faith, being baptized, making their faith public. That has been really healthy for our church to do. And a lot of that has been because of a few minor adjustments that we've made. We've seen 84 people. It's been 31 households. But if you kind of break out those households, we've had 84 new people actually join the church, not just come for a visit, but come be connected, they're saved, they're baptized, join our church. We've seen 45 adults go through our discipleship program, which it really is brand new. We launched that kind of in the middle of the summer. So that's only been about six months or so that we've been doing that. But, but the bottom line is we've done our best to steward people who, who want to know Jesus, who are looking for a church family to the best of our ability. And, and the reason that the timing is impeccable for us to really begin to focus on evangelism and outreach and reaching our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ is because there would have been a few months ago, we would have been pouring water into a leaky vase, so to speak. We really did, we needed some systems in place to be able to steward people that do come to our church and, and be able to, to have a discipleship ministry, be able to grow them. So the timing is impeccable, but beyond that, probably what's most important is that it is deeply biblical for a church to be just drastically concerned with reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This, this is, it's almost Christianity in church 101. Like the New Testament is legitimately a missionary handbook of people going out and reaching other people with, with the message of Jesus. That really is, is the New Testament as a whole. If you look at, at Acts, Acts 2, you see that the early church, they nailed four things. If you read Acts 2 and you get to the end of Pentecost and you find out what that early church did, that early church just was fantastic at four things. They were fantastic at doctrine. I feel like our church does, does a really good job of emphasizing and keeping doctrine straight and before you. They did a really good job of prayer. I feel like we're growing in this and that we're getting better at prayer. They did a really good job at fellowship. That's probably a whole nother discussion for a whole nother day. But I do feel like that our church family wants and has a desire to love and to edify and to build each other up and to, and to fellowship together. And then they did a really good job on evangelism. You find that that, that early church had four really basic components that they valued and put a premium on doctrine, on prayer, on fellowship, and on evangelism. So for any church to emphasize evangelism or outreach or reaching the lost with the gospel of Christ is, is deeply biblical and needed. And my desire for our church is that we would just grow in what it means 
to get the lost to the message and to get the message to the lost. And I feel like if I'm honest, just with and candid with our church family, I feel like we do a pretty good job of getting the lost to the message. We have some, some days that are designed to be evangelistic in nature, that we have uh, an Easter or a Christmas musical or, or a first responder Sunday. And the, and the point of those days is to honor some people, to, to have a good time, yes, but really the, the overarching point of those days is to have a gospel-centered day that we try to, to get some people here that don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ to give you an opportunity to invite your unsaved family and, and coworkers and neighbors and friends and to be able to get the lost to the message and to share the gospel. And we have, we have people on all of those services every single year that, that get saved, that come to know Christ. And we praise the Lord for that. And I, I feel that you as a church body, that we do a good job of trying to take some invites, get some people here, and, and to share that. Uh, we could probably grow a little bit in that, but I feel like we do a good job where I really feel, if I'm honest with, with our church family, that, that I need to grow, that, that I personally need to grow, that, that my wife and I need to grow, that maybe even we as a church body need to grow, is that in getting the message to the lost. That in, in feeling comfortable to take our faith and to just share it. Not, not just come to church and hear the message and Pastor Mark will preach the gospel or someone else will meet you there. But there, there, you know, you have a lot of people that you've invited to church that for one reason or another, they just don't want to come to church. Maybe, maybe they're Catholic. Maybe they just, they, they, they don't want to go to church because they had a bad experience. Whatever it may be. So what are we going to do? Just sit back and say, you know what? They won't come to the message. So we, you know, I, I guess their luck's ran out. No. We have to be able as a church family to bring the message to them and to evangelize and, and share with them. And I'm praying this year that the Lord would really do a work of grace in our hearts and that he would help us understand what it means to share the gospel with people, what it means to share our faith with people, what it means to, to be comfortable just giving Jesus to those that you know need the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm convinced we, we live in a culture that in many ways is anti-Christian, but I'm convinced that the lost are more amazed at our silence than they are offended at our message. And many times Christians have, have stepped back and said, you know what, for fear of offending somebody or for fear of sharing something that someone else may, may not like, that, that we, we shut down or we clam up or we just feel uncomfortable sharing. But I'm convinced that those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ are more amazed by our silence than they are offended by, by the message that we actually give them. So my, my vision, really, and this is, this is a simple vision. This isn't, this isn't uh, ultra complicated. My vision for this year and the focus for this year that I want our, our church family to really just kind of wrap our hearts and minds around is that of community to crowd? Is that of let's get the lost to the message? Let's get the message to the lost. Let's, let's grow in what it means to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with those that are around us. Let me tell you a little bit about how we want to do this in, in, a, in a wellness regimen of sorts that I would be prescribing for our church family that we, want to, that we really just want to f hone in on and focus in on through the year 2018. So we're going to do a lot of this just through teaching and preaching. So this is something that as a pastor, I want to keep before you as a church body continually throughout the course of this year. So uh, we'll, we'll begin this actually next Sunday, and we'll begin just by on Sunday mornings walking through the book of Philippians. So the book of Philippians is, if there was ever a book that there was a church that was striving together for the faith of the gospel that was pulling together in gospel ministry to try to reach the lost with the message of Jesus Christ. If there was ever a book of the Bible that was written to commend that, it would be the book of Philippians. And we're going to begin next Sunday morning just kind of going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through that book. It'll probably take us five or six months. I've been prepping for this for, for a number of months now to try to understand a church that did this well. A church that really was striving together for the gospel and doing the best, their best to share Jesus with people. We will also offer some Wednesday night classes. So we have one that's actually, I'll be teaching it this, this coming semester. But three days from now, Wednesday night, we'll start. I have, I have a class that, that I'll be teaching called Speaking of Jesus. How, how to share your faith with the lost. How to, how to engage in evangelism. And, and we're going to offer that class really just kind of on, on a recurring basis. We're going to offer it in the summer. We're going to offer it in the fall. And my ask to you, if you come to our Wednesday night with, 
which several hundred of you do on a regular basis, my ask is that if you come on Wednesday night, at least one time this year, it could be the spring with me, it could be in the summer, it could be in the fall, but at least one of those, would you get in one of those classes? If you don't come on Wednesday night, consider it. Consider coming to a class where we'll do our best to, to help you feel comfortable sharing your faith and engaging the lost with the message of Jesus. We'll do this through our Sunday school program. Later in the year, we'll actually have a, a series that uh, our Sunday school teachers will, will kind of go through together on evangelism, and we're vetting out a couple options on that right now. But, but we want to emphasize this, and we want, and I want as a pastor to keep this continually in front of our church family this year. And, and if, can I be honest? It'd be good to be honest, right? For, for a long time, I, I thought the approach to evangelism from a pastor or from a church, before I actually was pastoring, my philosophy was that, you know what? People just need to be fired up when it comes to evangelism. People just need to be kind of inflated a little bit, light a fire under them, you know. The problem is apathy, that people just need to, they need to want to do it. And, and the longer that I've lived and the more that I've grown, and honestly the more that, that I've pastored, I've realized I don't think that's true. I, I believe that the vast majority of Christians know intuitively that they should share their faith with someone else. If you read the New Testament at all, it, it's really self-obvious. I also believe that the majority of Christians want to do that. I have yet personally to meet a Christian who said, you know what, I just don't want to share my faith with anyone. I have no desire to give Jesus to someone who doesn't know Jesus. I've never met that person. Maybe they exist. If they are, I would question that they're a Christian because you naturally just want to share what Jesus is doing in your life. But I believe with all my heart that, that I, that, that my children one day, when they come to know the Lord, Lord willing, that they will want to, that they'll know, hey, I should share my faith, that they'll want to share their faith. But there is a disconnect, and many times we don't share our faith, right? I've I, ever been there. I've been there where you clam up or you, or you just you don't witness and, and you think that you should, but you let the opportunity pass. We've all been there, right? So what is, what's the disconnect? We know we should, we want to, but many times we don't. I, I really feel it's my job as, as pastor not to guilt trip you, not to, not to try to just light a fire under you and, and to fight apathy. I feel it's my job as a pastor to encourage you and to equip you and to do my best to set an example of let's, let's share the message of Jesus with people. I, I want to do my best this year, just, just kind of corporately through teaching and preaching to help you understand what it means to share your faith, even sometimes what it doesn't mean to share your faith. Now, m many people, many Christians have, have these myths that need to be debunked about evangelism and sharing their faith with people. Some of you in this room would think, you know what, I'd love to share my faith, but I'm not outgoing I'm not, I'm not good at presentations. Uh, I, I can't memorize very many verses. So I just don't know that that's me. Can, can I tell you, you don't have to be an extrovert to share the gospel with people. You don't. You don't, you don't have to be good at presentations. Most people are, are scared of giving a presentation to people. But you do have to be good at conversations. And the good news about conversations is that you've been having conversations since you were three years old. <laughs> You're a pro at it. Like literally. You will have 20 plus conversations today with people. So anyway, you don't have to be good at presentations, but if you can carry on a conversation of any length, then, then you can do it. You, you don't have to memorize verses. You honestly don't. You don't have to be a walking Bible dictionary. You know, what will they ask me? I'm going to be scared. I, I want you to come to one of these classes on Wednesday night and, and allow me, allow us to help you debunk those myths. Allow us to help you see that you don't have to be an altogether different person and turn into super Christian that's an extrovert in order to share your faith with people. You don't have to do that. You don't even, you can use whatever method you want to share your faith. Some of you would be really comfortable just walking up to a stranger or knocking on a door and talking about Jesus. Many of you would not. That's fine. You don't have to do that. There are so many methods and ways that we can be involved with people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can learn and grow together and be encouraged and equipped on what it means to have a winsome faith in public, what it means to actually share Jesus with other people. And, and I hope that the vast majority of this room would see some people that you're praying for, 
that you love, that you're desiring to come to church and you want to see them come to faith and know Jesus and how good it is to have a relationship with him. You, you want that. You desire it. I want you as, as a church body to see those people that are on your prayer list right now come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want as a pastor to, to set an example in this. If, if I'm honest, my problem is not that I feel uncomfortable sharing my faith with people. I've, I've grown to a point where I really, I don't feel uncomfortable with that. My problem is time. My problem is that I don't give myself space in a given week to fellowship enough with unbelievers to be able to share my faith with them. Now, I work at the church. All of my coworkers are saved. <laughs> at least I think, I hope. They're supposed to be. Right? And some of you are thinking, you know what I would give to work at a place where everyone was saved. I didn't have to put up with the garbage and the trash and the nonsense that, that's out there. I, I get that. I get that. I've, I've worked a lot of secular jobs. I get that. But on the flip side, you have the opportunity every single day to develop relationships with people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and influence them with the gospel. You know, my, my problem is not that I'm, that I'm uncomfortable. It's that I can be so busy with, with Christian things and fellowshipping with believers. And that's good and that's great. There, there's time and space for that, definitely. But if I'm not careful, I can let a week, two weeks, a month go by. And you know what? I haven't really had time with people that don't know the Lord. My wife and I pray for us. We're a little bit nervous about it, but we're going to try it. This summer, we're going to have a, a, a neighborhood Bible study with, with folks in our neighborhood just in kind of an off night. And it'll mean that we give up a, a family night throughout the course of the week, which we're okay with. But, but our goal there is to take some relationships that we've developed with people in, a, in our neighborhood and our neighbors and to be able to have them over and to, and to make those relationships go deeper and to begin to engage in conversations about the gospel. And that, that needs to be, that's my heart. That needs to be our heart. That you know what, there's, there's a lot of people. We have a lot of people in the room today. I love that. I, I love that our church has grown, that we have this campus, that we're not, you know, down in Nukin with, with no street parking any longer and, and trying to, to, to get, and I wasn't here for those days, but you were. You, you know what it was like to get to this place. But if we're, if we're not careful, what can set in is, you know what, Everybody drives down the 28. They see our sign. They know that we're here. We got it made in the shade with lemonade. Let them all come to us. They, they can come and hear the gospel if they want. And you know what? We're, look how many people are here today. We're fine. If we're not careful, that, can, that apathy can creep into our hearts. And we can begin to lose sight of what, what the Lord has for all of us. To, to get to a point where we can share our faith and do share our faith with those that are around us and need the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so I hope that you'll jump in. I, I hope that you'll engage in the content. I hope that this year that I will grow, that you will grow, that we will see the lost come to the message and the message come to the lost all at the same time. On top of that, I do want to give you a couple opportunities to be involved in that just this year. And, and these will unfold throughout the course of the year, but want to make you aware of them. Uh, we will continue to have some special services that you can just invite people to and, and hand them an invitation or share it on Facebook and invite people to, and, and that's valid. Uh, we'll continue to have some Faith at Works days. We'll do those once a month. Uh, if you've never been to one of those, then, then please come to one of those. We actually have one this Saturday. Uh, it's on your connection card. You can sign up. We're going to a nursing home to minister to some people there. We're going to some hospitals to minister to some people there. We have a, a crew going to a, a food bank, some, some different things that we're doing just to try to get our fingers into the community and be engaged with that. So if you've never done that, do that. If you feel uncomfortable, like I don't know that I would really feel comfortable leading in that, you don't have to lead. Come and just kind of be a shadow with somebody and watch someone who is a little bit more comfortable and you'll learn and grow through that. To watch someone uh, actually minister in Jesus' name, it'll, it'll make you feel more comfortable if you do that. So we'll have those uh, monthly. In addition to that, really, our desire and some of the goals that we're setting for this year are, are centered uh, specifically on this. So we want to get an invite to every home within a 10-mile radius of our church this year. We've done a good job of just kind of sprinkling invites, but we haven't done a great job of being systematic and making sure that, you know, if, if someone lives within a 10-mile radius of our church, we, wa we want to make sure that they get an invite to our church to come and to hear the gospel. 
Some of this will be through mass mailing. Some of this will be that we band together and we actually just kind of blitz and, and blanket a community with, with door hangers or something like that. But that's, that's roughly 22,000 doors. So that's a, that's a lot of doors to, to hit. But we, that's a very doable goal for us to make sure that we're inviting the lost to come to the message. We'll do a ton of this at Easter. So Easter's April 1 this year, and, and we'll talk more about this as we get into March. But basically for a two-week time frame, from March the 13th to March the 27th, we're going to go nuts on trying to get the message of, of hey, come to Easter this year. And we have people, we have a ton of people that come every year. We have people that are saved every year. Some of you in this room have come to Easter maybe last year or the year before, and now you're here as part of the church family because of that. We're going to go bonkers on that. And, and we'll, we'll get there March. We'll, we'll talk about that. But through, through a series of, of just several days and things that we're doing, we're just going to do our best to saturate our community with an invite to our church and to try to get that to thousands and thousands and thousands of doors to, to see them come to Easter. Uh, we, we will launch actually a new summer outreach program. Dave Coyle is going to lead this for us in the summer. And so you'll stay tuned for more details on that. This could be something that's the greatest thing we've ever done. And, and we do it every single year. It could be something that we say, you know what? We tried it for a year and we want to adjust or want to cancel it next year. We'll see how it goes, but we're going to try this summer. We don't have, obviously you drove up the hill today, you know. During the winter, it's cold, it's snowy. It, it's tough to kind of get into the community because the community is all bundled up inside their houses by the fireplaces right now. So, but during the summer, we have some beautiful weather, some beautiful opportunities to do that. So we'll, we'll do that this summer, and, and Dave Coyle will lead that. Uh, we're going to do our best. I feel this really goes in line with, with sharing the message of Jesus with people is missions trips. So you have actually, you can look at it with me. You have in the seat back in front of you, or if you're on the front or back row, it's just right there on your row. You have a, a little sheet that looks like this. We took our first kind of big corporate missions trip just a, a few years ago to Nicaragua. How many of you, raise of hands, how many of you have been to Nicaragua in the past few years? Okay, so quite a, quite a few hands all, all over the room. I don't know how many total people we've taken to Nicaragua now. It has to be close to 200 at this point. So we did that a couple of years ago, and I, I really do believe that this goes hand in hand with having a heartbeat to share, to share the gospel with people, to minister, to get the message to the lost, even outside of our community. So this would actually lay out our, our mission trips between now and 2020. We want you just to kind of be aware of this, aware of some of the estimated costs, and to maybe plan on these. And I would say try to get on one of these mission trips because it really will help you and will shape your mind when it comes to just the world that's out there that needs the gospel. It will, it will, I guarantee you, if you've never done it, if you go to a third world country, it will affect your heart. It will change the way you see ministering in Jesus' name. It, it will do something for you that I can never do in my preaching. So we want to put these opportunities before you. We want you to be aware of them. Uh, there's actually an interest meeting. If you, this summer, we're going to London. Now, London's not third world, obviously, and that's not a tourist trip. Okay, we actually are going to go and minister. We'll take a day and do some touristy stuff, but the vast majority of our time, we'll be, we'll be ministering in the gospel while we're there. And uh, how many of you remember Andrew Bunnell, who was here for a missions conference? He was here, so we're going to partner with them. He has several churches there in the London area, and we're partnering with them. There's an interest meeting for London next Sunday after the service. So if you're interested in going on that trip, then, uh, then go to that interest meeting. It'll be after the service in, in the chapel, and we'll lay out all kind of more of the details. Uh, there's, there's an estimated cost for, for the adults. Uh, teens actually have a, a little bit lower cost, so you can go to that meeting if you're interested. Uh, we'll go to Israel in, in March. If I'm honest, Israel isn't a true missions trip. But, it, but it's something that you should consider going on if you've never done because it will help you see the Bible in a different way. Um, so, so we'll do that next kind of February, March time frame. Uh, Pastor Skelly will actually lead that trip. Uh, the interest meeting for that is here in a month. And then beyond that, next summer we're going to Vanuatu. Definitely third world. Definitely would, would change your life. Uh, after that, we're going to South America. So, so look at this. Consider, consider maybe taking, I know it's a sacrifice, but consider taking a week of vacation from work to go on a missions trip. Consider investing a little bit of money because what it will do is it will light a fire in you to share the gospel with other people and, and to learn that there's, there's a big world out there outside of the 10-mile radius that we're in. There's a big world that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, on top of that, I want to give you one other thing that I feel like goes really hand in hand with our focus for this year of, of getting the loss of the message and getting 
the message to the lost. And that is, that is our children's ministry. So we're about to roll out a, a litany of children's ministry enhancements that we've been working on for some time. And children's ministry has, has a lot of layers to it, honestly, when, when you're talking about stewarding and discipling uh, young children. But children's ministry done well in a church can make your church attractive to have people come hear the gospel. It can make your church sticky that people stick around longer. And there's definitely an evangelism arm to children's ministry. I'm, I'm curious to know this morning, how many of you were potentially saved at a VBS, at Sunday school, or maybe even between the ages of four and 12? You would say, I came to faith in Jesus Christ between the ages of four and 12. How many of you in the room, that, oh my word. So I, I would say the majority of the room. So we understand as a church that evangelism and sharing the gospel, my children are not saved yet. They're, they're young, they're you know, three, one, and newborn, so they're not really to, to that point where they can understand it yet. But my prayer is that one day through that children's ministry, through discipleship, through mom and dad, through hearing the gospel over and over and over again, that those children will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Many of you in this room, that's your testimony, that a children's ministry or a vacation Bible school or something was used to reach you. So that's extremely valid for us to understand that we're making disciples with those children. My, probably my favorite quote about children is that they're a message that you will send to a time that you will never see. And you think about that for a minute, the, the kids that are down the hall, however many of them there are this morning, 140, 150 of them, the kids that are down the hall from us right now, their message is that you and I will be sending to a time that we'll never see. Some of you have, have joked with me and, and said, you know, you're, you're young enough to be my kid or you're young enough to be my grandkid, you know, things like that. You know what, one day, 30 years from now, it could be that one of the kids down the hall right there will be my pastor. That, that's going to happen eventually. Some young person's going to grow up and, and one day they'll pastor me and you and us. And so we understand that to invest in, in those children is valid, is biblical, is something that needs to happen. And we will see, Lord willing, we do and will continue to see many, many people come to faith in Jesus Christ through our children's ministry. So we want to do our best. I feel like our children's ministry is really good. It's really solid. But we, we feel that we can go from good to great. Uh, we've done our best. Uh, Travis and Tesla joined our staff team here in September, whatever that was, five, six months ago. And we did our best as a church staff to provide Travis some time and space to hone in on children's ministry for 15, 20 hours a week. So we have over the past four or five months, if there was something to be evaluated in children's ministry, we have gone through that with a fine tooth comb. We have put it under a magnifying glass and we have done our best to evaluate it. We haven't made many changes at, at all yet, but we have done our best to evaluate that. Uh, Travis actually just a month ago on January the 6th had a meeting with many of you are children's workers and you were in that meeting, had a meeting for two hours and talked about the things that we want to improve and grow in in our children's ministry. I don't have two hours to share all that with you this morning. So you'll see that as, as it comes through time. But we want to enhance a lot. I'll give you maybe the top five things that you would see in children's ministry that will be changing here uh, in the new future. So we're going to have a, a check-in and check-out system that is a little bit better. Right now, if you have kids, you know it's a little bit chaotic to check your kids in and out of class. And that actually will, will start next week. We're prepared for that. We're ready to do that next week. Be patient with us. There inevitably will be some kinks to work out. So be patient with us as we try to, to care for your children to a greater capacity. But we'll do that. Uh, we've, we've really adjusted our curriculum and have a unified curriculum that we think will help us. Uh, it'll help our children just grow further faster and to mature, and, and we've adjusted some of that. Even signage, you know, right now if a new person comes into church, they don't know where children's stuff is. They have no idea. They're like, big lobby, lots of people. What do I do with my kids? So we, we need to put some signage out around our church. Uh, we actually will, in the fall, we'll launch a new Wednesday program. We love our, our Wednesday program right now. My kid is in that program. He loves that program. He's singing the songs and memorizing the verses, things like that. But we feel like we can make that better and that we, can, that we can do something that even is above and beyond what we're doing. So something like an Awanas program will start in the fall for our children on Wednesdays. Uh, during the summer, we're going to have some activities for kids every other week. I could go on and on and on, honestly. 
but we want to do our best as, as a church body to, to ensure that we are really honing in on our children's ministries this year and making them fully functional and as good as they possibly can be. So here is, here's the bottom line of, of our focus. I've, I've spent a, a lot of time just trying to talk and share heartbeat and passion and, and what's, what's on my heart. The bottom line is this. The primary thing that, that I want our church family to be able to say when we get to the end of 2018, when we get to December 31st of 2018, I want us to be able to, to take a deep breath and say, you know what? We honestly did our best to get the lost to the message and the message to the lost. Not that we were perfect. Not that there won't be some things to grow in and improve on and, and to grow further in, in 2019, but that we get to the end of 2018 and we say as, as a church family, we did our best to evangelize, to engage, to reach out, to share Jesus Christ with lost people all around us that, that need the gospel. On top of that, I want to give you a couple upcoming improvements. And I won't, I won't take long on these, but I want you to at least be aware of them. Understand, there's no way I could tell you every little thing that we'll tweak or adjust or improve this year. With a ministry our size and as many moving parts as we have, that's an impossibility. But I do want to give you two that are happening really now that will affect all of us that I want you to be aware of. So first is we're going to try our hand at communicating our, our announcements to you as a, as a church family uh, by way of video. The reason we want to try at least this is we think that it will make our announcements easier to digest. Uh, there, there is a lot of stuff happening at our church all the time, and it would be very easy for us to get up for 10 minutes and just list all the stuff. If you're in a Sunday school class, you know what I'm talking about. The, those announcement sheets are long. There's, there's a lot happening, and we think it'll, it'll make it easier to digest and remember what's happening around our church. Honestly, we think it'll give us a better flow of service on Sunday mornings. Right now, we get to the end of the service, and we just kind of tack on the announcements, and it's not... At times it does feel weird or, or out of place, so we think that these will allow us to have just a better continuity and, and really help our flow of service on Sunday mornings. And it allows us just to post it on the Facebook or, or website or whatever it may be to let people know what's going on rather than, hey, here's a sheet you have to read or something like that. Um, so we're going to try our best to, to do these. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to try it for a month. If we like it, we'll keep it. If we don't like it, we won't do it. How's that sound? So some of you are going to love the video announcements. Some of you will probably be like, why am I watching a video for announcements? So I, feedback is welcome. Communicate that to us. We would, we would love to know what, what you feel or think. Say, so what happens if someone likes it and someone doesn't? Well, Pastor Mark gets to decide then. So <laughs> I'm joking, but not joking. So uh, if, if we, honestly, if we don't like them, we won't do them, but we're going to try it for, for a month. We actually have one. Would you all like to see one of these this morning? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Let's, uh, guys, cue, cue that up. Let, this would be kind of what, what it would be like. Good morning, Harvest family. We welcome you to our annual Vision Sunday, one day a year that we cast the vision in an effort to make us mature followers of Jesus. My name is Aaron, and we want to thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If this is your first time with us today, we want to thank you for spending part of your weekend here with us. The only thing that we ask of you is to take your connection card and fill out whatever information you're comfortable sharing. That said, we would like to take a few moments and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family. At Harvest, our mission is to make mature followers of Jesus. And if you are newer at our church, you may be thinking, how do I do that? The best way to get connected at Harvest is to join a small group Bible study. We have small groups on Sunday mornings. We have a ladies group that meets on Tuesdays. And starting February 7th, our midweek small groups on Wednesday nights. There are many different classes and topics to choose from, so you can sign up by indicating your desired class in your connection card. As a teenager at Harvest, there were many times that we would minister to elderly in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. We would sing with them, we would pray with them and for them and their families, or just be that person that they can talk to. This Saturday, for Faith That Works, we will have a couple of teams of people that will be going to Rosebrook Assisted Living, as well as other different hospitals in our area to provide encouragement and prayer for those families that can really use it. If you are interested in this opportunity, make a note of that in your connection card so that we can better prepare. We look forward to seeing you there. 
In the book of Acts, we read of a congregation that were saved, baptized, and then added to the church. If you are interested in taking your attendance at Harvest to the next step by becoming a member, we would love to have you join our Discover membership class. In this class, you will learn a brief history of our church, what it means to be a Baptist, and the biblical model for believers to meet together at church. If you would like to sign up for this class, you can do that with the connection card found in the bulletin. Parent and baby dedication is coming up on February 25th. If you are interested in or would like more information about being involved in that special service, just write in the comment section of the connection card and we'll connect with you this week. We want to thank you for joining our worship services today. We believe that God brought you here for a reason and that he has something he wants to say specifically to you. And our hope is that you today leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. Let us know if we can help you in any way while you are here with us today. And be sure to connect with us at harvestbaptist.info and on social media to stay up to date with everything happening here at Harvest. We hope you have a great weekend. So it'll be something like that. And, uh, and we'll try it here through the month of February and see what we think. If we like the, the feel that it gives to our service, that it actually does communicate uh, kind of the announcements and, and message better, or if it doesn't, and we'll, we'll see where we land a month from now, but we'll, we'll try it out and see how it goes. In, in addition to that, I do want you to, to pray with me and with us about something that's, that's an upcoming change that you inevitably will, will see and will be able to tell here, Lord willing, in the next few months. And we are desiring to, to hire a full-time staff member to spearhead our music program here at the church. Uh, we have, we have a, a great staff team here at the church, and, and really when I say great, I mean like the world's greatest staff team. We have a, a body of people here at the church who behind the scenes, you know, Monday through Friday, work to make things happen and get things done, who are, who are highly competent and qualified and, and talented. And as I look at kind of our staff team, uh, I really feel the last big piece we need to add to that team is someone in-house to, to really own and be over our music ministry. Uh, we would have loved to have done this a year ago, but we really felt like we wanted to be cautious just with, with a bit of transition and, and dust settling and, and looking at what does the next year hold or not hold for our church. We're optimistic. We think the future's bright, but you know, we don't want to overextend ourselves. So, so we really hit the brakes on that and didn't seek to hire someone in that position, although we, we had a desire to, I had a desire to. But we're at a point now where we feel very comfortable hiring someone in that position uh, to be on, on our staff. Really the only hindrance we had was, was money. Uh, and it's just been a really, really good financial year for us. Uh, what we need to make budget, so to speak, or to pay all the bills, if you broke it down over the course of a year, our budget would tell us that we needed about $29,000 a week to, to make this ministry happen. That includes, obviously, giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars in missions and those sorts of things. But we have, we have now, our fiscal year started August 1st, so since then, in the last five months or so, We've really, we've hit budget every week with that, with that 29000 And on top of that, we've brought in an extra about $110,000 that really we've just, we've set in the bank. We haven't really spent it, but we've, we feel very comfortable. The, the amount of money that's coming through to, to allow our budget to do this in the future, we feel very comfortable making that step and to be able to bring on someone to do music. Now, we have, we have an awesome volunteer music team, and, th and they're all volunteers. I'm talking from all the choir to the orchestra and those that lead it, and I would be remiss if I didn't at least say a giant thank you to, I don't know where you all are in the building this morning, but, but to, to Andy and to Brian Hazlett and to Casey and to, to Kathy Winkle and to Rich and to, I'm inevitably leaving some people out who lead in, in our music ministry, so as volunteers... They are the best, but it really would help us if we had someone here on our staff team to, to own that, to be in control of that, and to be able to be a music minister with, with our church family. We've had that in years past. In just the past couple years, we have not had that. And so pray with us about that. Um, we, we, want to, we want the right person and the right fit to, to be here we want a lot of wisdom in that. So I really, honestly, I would covet your prayers as I and we, we're taking a, a team approach to this that uh, other pastors and deacons will, will be involved in this decision. Uh, we're, we're definitely taking approach of we'd love to have 10 or 12 people that apply for that and want that 
so that we can kind of choose between uh, several different applicants. So if you know of someone that maybe you think would be a good fit, let us know. We'd be happy to share a job description with them and, and see if they're interested in that. We want as many qualified applicants really as we can get for that. But our, our goal is to add someone to that team so that we can uh, really take our, our music program to where it needs to be. That's throughout the week, working with our kids and, and orchestra and things like that. But especially on, on Sundays as, as we worship here together, there is, um, th- there's, there's going to be a process uh, I don't know exactly when that will happen. So that could happen three months from now. That could happen nine months from now. We're really going to leave that in the Lord's hands. We're going to work diligently towards that end. But if you would pray with us, we would love that. And, and here, Lord willing, in the near future, there'll be someone else that, that is joining our team that will get to uh, kind of lead and, and play a part in our worship services and, and things of that nature. Let me end this morning by giving you two big dreams. And I appreciate you giving me just just your attention and letting me share a bit of of vision and and passion with you this morning. But I want to give you two things that are, that really press beyond 2018 and and go out into 2019, 2020, 2021, and and maybe even beyond that, that I feel are are really directional for our church family. And, And my fear of ending with this, here's honestly, my fear of ending with this is that we'll leave today with this as the emphasis rather than our focus for 2018. So I do want you to remember that our focus for this year is getting the loss to the message and the message to the loss. That's where we want to be. We want that to be our bread and butter. We want to hone in on that this year. But I do want to at least communicate a couple things that have been on my mind, in my heart, that I haven't felt comfortable sharing publicly up until this point. And there's maybe a couple reasons for that. Some of it was it just... The vision needed to mature in my own mind a little bit, and it needed to marinate and, and be in the oven, so to speak, for a little bit longer. Uh, some of that was I felt like we just we needed to do a few things at the church and, and get to this space before we communicated them. Uh, but they've, they've marinated long enough, and I want to give you two things that, that excite me. And, and really, I look at the future and think this would be awesome if we could do this. So one is this. I'm calling it Burn the Note. I would love, and I say I, I speak for our pastors and deacons as well, we would love for our church to be debt-free. Right now, we have, we have $3 million in debt. It's, it's technically $3 million and 47000 Now, some of you are thinking, oh, a church our size, $3 million, you know, that's no big deal. Some of you are thinking $3 million is a ton of money. <laughs> so you, let, let me help frame this in for you a little bit to tell you how you should feel about $3 million, Okay. So for a church our size, $3 million is, is frankly not a lot of debt when you compare it to, to other ministries and, and potentially how much debt they would have. Uh, that means our payment on $3 million in debt is just a smidge under $29,000 a month. It's, it's 28 and change. And that's honestly not a struggle for us to pay that on a monthly basis, to, to pay that mortgage and, and to make that happen. We, we do that consistently or even to pay a little bit extra. There's, there's not a struggle there. And for a ministry that has millions of dollars coming in and out annually, um, this, this isn't, uh, it's, it's not a stretch for us to make that happen. And, and think kind of big picture here. So we have just in, just in kind of capital projects, we have seven and a half to eight million dollars invested in this campus. When you look at what it took to get a driveway up here, to, to put this building here, to add on a wing in the back or, or the, the awning out front or to buy these chairs that are in front of you. We have about seven and a half or eight million dollars in, in kind of capital projects that we've invested in over the past 10 years really, over the past decade. So we've already paid off four and a half to five million dollars of that and we have about three million dollars left in that. And as, as I and we gaze into the future, there is no scenario, there is no dream that we could conjure up that would be less appealing if we did not have debt. No, ma- no matter what we look at in the future, if we did not have $3 million in debt, it would make that future better, no, no matter what we wanted to do. So for us to reach that point would be something that would be really neat for us. Uh, and just think for a minute what we could do with $29,000 a month extra? Like, you know how we could reach the loss with the message if we had an extra $29,000 a month? What we could do missionally with, with that much money every single month? I mean, 
you, the sky's the limit on that. You start to talk about, well, we could have radio or television or missions that we could invest in. You know, we could, we could build, this is how I think of it, we could build Seth and Nicole Stokes a home every month if we wanted to. We did that last year. We, we gave them about $40,000 to build them a home in Vanuatu. We could build a village over the course of a year. You know, we're not going to build a village. That's, that's not the plan. But there's so much that, that we could do if, if that was not, um, I hate to say hanging over our heads because it, it's not a burden per se, but we would love to, to be free and clear of that. So, and even you think about the future, you know how easy it would be to build a new auditorium, you know, right there in that grass lot if, if we were free and clear of that and had an extra $29,000 a month. And I do think that that is, that's in the future plans for our church. That's not, my heartbeat and my passion isn't a building. My, my heartbeat and my passion is, is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I do think that one day in, in the future of our church, we will put an auditorium there. I, I, I love this space. But there are downfalls to a multi-purpose room. You know, most churches don't have basketballs hanging over their head and the acoustics, I mean, the, the sound just gets swallowed up in here. It would be awesome to have a sanctuary where just the, it's, it's made for worship. That would be fantastic. And I think that will happen in the future. What I'm saying is this, without that $3 million in debt, it makes that step so much easier. So much easier. It makes any step that we want to take so much easier. So my, I want to begin just to, just to talk about this on a consistent basis and let you know kind of how that's going and what's happening with the debt. And my ask for you is twofold. So two, I, I simply would ask this, would you at least pray about this? Would you at least put on your prayer list, Lord, help us to pay off the note on this place so that we can accomplish more for your glory? Would you consider just, just being a prayer partner and praying that way? And, and I can picture in my mind's eye, I can picture a day where we are all here and we bring the note to this place up on this platform and with a giant smile on all of our faces, we take a lighter and we burn the thing. That would be a fun day, would it not? To have a celebration day where we burn the note and say it's done, it's gone. That would be awesome. So pray that that would happen. God's big. God, God could do that tomorrow if he wanted to. So, so pray that that will happen. I will also ask you to consider contributing to that. Now, now we're not, we're not, I'm not putting a thermometer up on the stage. We're not having a, a building banquet and you're making pledges and commitments. We're not, we're not doing that. But if you would consider giving something to that, I would love it. I personally, uh, my wife and I are doing that. We have recently adjusted some things. We, we sold a car last week to allow us a little bit of extra money to contribute a bit to this. So we've had on our, I, I wonder how many of you have ever wondered this. We've had on our um, offering envelopes, there's basically kind of three categories. Many of you, and I thank you for your faithfulness that you tithe and you give to our church. Uh, many of you give to our faith promise. You give to our missions program of our church. But below that, there's, there's one that says building fund. And it was years ago that we were raising money for this building, right? And everyone was, was kind of giving to the building fund to make this possible. Now we're here. Now it's materialized. How many of you have maybe ever thought, like, what is that building fund there? Are we building something? Are we saving for a new building? I don't know if you've ever thought that. Here's, here's what I, what I want to say to you. If, you. if you will give anything in the building fund line, we will apply that directly to the principal of our loan. We won't use it to pay the bills. We won't use it to pay our, our normal monthly payment. We will apply that directly to the principal of our loan. Now, don't, don't take your tithe and put it there. That's, that's, gonna, you know, that's counterproductive, okay? So, so don't do that. But if you already give to that, uh, may, maybe a little bit, or you're willing to, then, then please do. I, I know that my wife and I personally will, just to try to help us see the debt on this place be reduced faster. I don't, I don't know how soon that will be. Maybe that's, maybe that's a year, maybe that's two, maybe it's five. I don't know. But I do know that for us to get aggressive with that and to try to take that off of us would be helpful for our future immensely. So if, if you would consider that, Honestly, uh, we would love it, and it would go a long way for, for our church here to be able to one day burn the note on this place. Secondly and lastly, I want to give you just kind of a big dream of mine. And that is, that is a, I'm calling it a church plant or a church revitalization. So as, as I look into the future five years from now or 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, whatever it may be, there is, th this is what I see. 
And I shared a little bit of this when, when I actually candidated. Someone had asked a question, what do you see 10 years from now for our church? And, and I talked about this for, for about 60 seconds or so that night. As we ask ourselves this question, which is our primary question, what can we do to best accomplish this task, make mature followers of Jesus? What can we do to be more effective in making mature followers of Jesus? I certainly see us winning the lost here in the Toronto Heights and in Sarver and in New Kensington and, and all over the place. But if we, if we really were serious about impacting our area with the gospel, if we were serious about getting the gospel to Millville or Monroeville or Robinson, those people aren't driving to 224 Harvest Lane. Now, maybe, maybe a couple of them here or there, but, but they're, they're not going to come this way. I, I want for our church right here to impact this 10-mile radius and to just be in our community and ministering in the gospel. But, but if we really wanted to impact our region and we wanted to expand that to a 50-mile radius, there's no way we do it all on this campus. That I, I really believe that the future of our church as we gaze out now, 5, 10, 15 years from now, it looks like this, that there is a healthy, vibrant, growing, loving, gospel-centered church at 224 Harvest Lane that is doing their best to reproduce themselves in other churches around our area. Now, now, let me frame that in a little bit to give you what that would potentially look like here in the future. So I would love, my first choice would be to revitalize a church. If there was a church that really was, was kind of just hanging on by a thread, and they said, would you come help us? That'd be my first choice, because there is a little body of people. They're actually, they typically will have a building, and that will make it an easier step, but I and we are, are wide open to the idea of planting a church, and, and the goal and the vision is for us to potentially plant some churches that are what I would call a daughter church. So a, a daughter church would be this, a church that we give birth to, that bears our name, and is part of our family, and as that church grows and matures, there comes a point where we wet it off. And we say, okay, fly away, be autonomous, now be your own church that's re reproducing itself. That there would be churches that we are, we've been involved in a couple church plants. We've been involved with, uh, with, with Pastor Snow out in Cranberry, trying to help them plant a church in Cranberry. Uh, Mike Clark and Legacy down in the city, trying to help them plant that church. But it was very arm's length. It was very arm's length. That, hey, let us, we'll give you a little bit of money, we'll offer some support, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be a prayer partner, but very arm's length. And, and that's not what, what our goal is. Our goal is to potentially have some churches that we plant that are daughter churches that are part of our family, that bear our name, that their, their pastor would come to our staff meetings, that we would we'd have all the finances under one roof, that, we would, that we'd have kind of a family of churches. And as that church grows and matures, and if we're in that relationship, that church can grow and mature faster, that we then release it and say, okay, now go autonomous, do your thing and begin to reproduce yourself. Now that's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not. But, it, but if, if I wanted you to kind of catch a long-term vision for our church, we have some things to do here. We have some growing to do here. We, we have some, some goals, some objectives, some, a mission to accomplish here. But I think that our mission extends beyond here and even beyond just, just sending missionaries around the world, but impacting our region. To, to begin, I, I'm praying that in the next 18 to 24 months that the Lord would allow us to do this. Really financially right now, we're in a spot where we can do this. We, we have enough money in our missions budget right now. We had a great missions conference, a great year in that, and we have taken on some new missionaries. We have increased support of some missionaries. We have, we have done some projects with that, but we actually have enough money in our missions budget to be able to just give that money away and invest it in, in a whole other church plant. So financially, we're equipped to do this right now. Practically speaking, we have been trying to pray, research, talk, uh, kind of pick the brain of an Andrew Bunnell who's doing this in London. I talked to him for probably three or four hours when he was here at Missions Conference, trying to begin to lay some foundation and groundwork for our church to, to begin to think outside of this, this property, but begin to think to other places to be able to impact people that are never going to come here, people that are never going to hear the gospel if, if we can't put a church in their area. So that, that's a big, that's a big time goal. I don't know all the answers to that. We do not have everything figured out with that yet. So pray for wisdom for that. Pray for direction for that. Pray that the Lord will lead us in that and, and partner with us in that way because it's, it's our goal in, in a big time way to, to have our church reproduce itself all over our community and our region to see more people come to faith in Jesus Christ, to see more people 
Learn what it means to be a mature follower of Jesus Christ. Here's, here's what I want to end with this morning. I just want to end with, with some prayer. In your, and I thank you for giving me a little bit of extra time. There's, there's so much more that, that I even could say. But that's the body of our focus for this year. What's our focus? Reaching people. Getting the loss to the message, getting the message to the loss, honing in on that. There's a couple upcoming changes that are happening. There's a couple big dreams that we would love in a few years to reach out into and, and to see those materialize. But I want this morning just to pray. There's, there's on, your, on your handout, if you've got a bulletin, the end of it has some next steps and actually has some specific prayers. These would be some prayers that I, as, as your pastor, am praying that the Lord would, would allow us to, to see these are some prayers that um, are part of maybe my routine at this point that I'm really praying. And I want to read these four prayers for you. I, I hope that you'll maybe take this, put it in your, in your diary, put it on your fridge, whatever. Make it part of your, of your dinner routine with your family. Pray for one of these. In evangelism, I'm praying that, that all of us would have this heartbeat. God, give me today an opportunity to speak to someone about Jesus. Give me the wisdom to see it and give me the courage to, to take it. Lord, today, help me to be able to share my faith with somebody. I'm praying with, with hiring. Would you pray with us? Father, give my church leadership wisdom that they need to, to make the right decision in, in, who they're, in who they're hiring this year. Uh, I covet that wisdom and I covet those prayers. In debt, pray this. Lord, would you allow us to pay off the note to accomplish more for your glory? In a church plant, God, lead our church demonstrably so that we can know clearly the next steps in regard, in regard to planning another church. Would you, would you pray those four with me? And this morning, I want us just to end where maybe you've there from your seat. Maybe, maybe you grab your wife and you say, say a few words and you pray together. Maybe you just pray privately right there from your seat. But I want us just to take two minutes and say, Lord, would you help us? And, and I mean that. There's, there's no way that we do something for the glory of God without his help. There's no way. So pray for wisdom. For, for demonstrable leadership, that the Lord would open the doors, that he would that he allow us to share our faith with people. I'm going to have Joyce come and, and, and play the piano here softly. I'll have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to ask you for two minutes right where you sit, just to pray for, for our church this year, that the Lord would use us to evangelize our community, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers.